Welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. Welcome. To you. If you know Mary, you know Jesus. Good evening, everyone. My name is Bob Cantoni, and I'm offering this program to help listeners to come to know the mother of Jesus so that she can help us to come to know her beloved Son and our beloved Lord and Savior. Jesus Christ, whom is our, who He is our goal. He is the uh, He should become the object of our love, the object of our very being, and the ultimate good that we are all striving for, that we should all be striving for, and that we should lift our hearts and minds above this earth and earthly things, so that we can attain the ultimate goal of union with with God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit through Jesus Christ, our beloved Lord and Savior. And Mary is the powerful advocate and powerful mother who can help us and guide us and teach us to that ultimate goal. So that's the purpose of this program. And I have a statement by St. Louis de Montfort who confirms that, especially in these end times. And uh, he talks about before the second coming of Christ, and, uh, you know, one of the aims of this show is for exactly this purpose here, which I'm about to read you. And this is what he says, taken from the secret of Mary. He says, Mary scarcely appeared in the first coming of Christ, but in the second coming of Jesus Christ, Mary must be known and openly revealed by the Holy Spirit so that Jesus may be known, loved, and served through her. That is Mary's greatest role, so that the Holy Spirit, through Mary, can make Jesus be known and loved and served through her. So that's why Jesus so lovingly gave us his mother at the foot of the cross. He so lovingly said, woman, behold your son. John, behold your mother. And John, of course, the beloved disciple, represents the whole church all the members of the church, because we are all supposed to become the beloved disciples of Jesus. But we become a beloved disciple of Jesus when we imitate John by taking Mary into our own homes and and just simply letting her be our mother. So that is the purpose of this show, and I hope all those listening um, will greatly benefit to what we're going to talk about tonight. I want to do a little recap on what we talked about last week, and we mentioned that Mary uh, truly is our teacher, our guide. She's our mother. She mothers us, nurtures us, guides us, forms us. Among other things, she protects us. But the main thing is she teaches us and prepares us so that we can attain that goal, being uh, united with God for all eternity. And that is her greatest passion, if you will, to make the rest of her children and to help them and and so that she could form us into another image of Jesus, her son, pleasing to the Father. So we'll talk a little bit about that, just a recap and a confirmation of what we talked about last week by St. John Bosco. Also, um, if we have time, I want to get to a, a, a striking confirmation and connection um, with what uh, one of the saints talked about, St. Alphonsus Liguori, and how uh, our Blessed Mother talks to Father Golby in the Marian Movement of Priests, and you're gonna, I think you're going to find that pretty, pretty interesting. And we also, since it's Lent, the, well, the beginning of Lent is next week, it's our Ash Wednesday in the Roman Catholic Church, the Roman Rite starts Wednesday of next week, February 14th, and I'd like to talk a little bit about the passion as seen through the eyes of the saints. So 
If we have time, hopefully we can get to all of that, but nevertheless, uh, we'll pick up where we left off on the next show. So let's begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Come, Holy Spirit. Come by means of the most powerful intercession of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, your well-beloved spouse, your Immaculate Mother. Again, we come before you, and we ask you, we beg your intercession to be a mother to us, so that you can, and please surround us, protect us with your heavenly mantle of grace, and bring to us the gifts of the Holy Spirit, your spouse. Please intercede for us before the Spirit of God, the one Jesus promised. He says, I, I will send you the Spirit of the truth, the Spirit of my Father, who will teach you all things and remind you of all that I have taught you. So we're here before you, dear Mother, and we're begging for those wonderful graces so that we could be taught these things that which Jesus desires to teach us tonight so that we can become those beloved disciples like St. John through your intercession. We ask all this in, your, in the holy name of Jesus and the intercession of St. Joseph and all the holy angels and saints and souls in purgatory. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, one of the other great riches of the Roman Catholic Church or the Catholic Church, the universal church, is the communion with the saints. What a treasure we have in the communion with the saints. And the greatest of these saints is Mary. Of course, we know her, great, her role, her charism is mother, is mother of God and mother of all of God's children. That is the greatest role, the greatest dignity that God could give to any creature. But there are many, many other saints that the Holy Spirit speaks through, and Jesus uses these saints, along with our Blessed Mother first and foremost, to teach us. Of course, he teaches us. God speaks to us in Scripture beautifully. But he also speaks to us through the body of Christ, the mystical body of Christ, the saints, the doctors of the church, Saints like our Blessed Mother, saints like St. Uh, Catherine of Siena, St. Louis de Montfort, St. Maximilian Colby, St. Peter, St. Paul, you name it, throughout the history of the church, um, St. Margaret Mary, for one, uh, all having to do with the Sacred Heart devotion. But Jesus speaks to us, the Holy Spirit speaks to us through these saints so that they can be an example of what it means to live fully the gospel of our Lord and, and to understand and to put together all of those um, shadowy areas in Scripture where that it makes sense to us and we could see with our eyes and hear with our ears how uh, uh, what, what it means to be a saint transformed through the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. What a beautiful thing. So we're going to talk, I have some writings on how our Lord shares his conversation and what he went through in the beginning of his passion, and he talks about his agony in the garden a little bit. He talks about the conversation that he's having within himself about Judas and how our Lord wept tears because he knew Judas was going to betray him. It's just beautiful. But these saints really, truly help us to, to see with our eyes and hear with our ears how to live the gospel that Jesus has so lovingly given to us. And it makes sense. It puts all of those areas in the gospel together so it can make more sense so that we can live it more fully. So I want to bring our, everyone's attention to um, John's gospel. And that is taken from verse, uh, chapter 14, verse 26, as well as verse 6 through 8, uh, from chapter 16 of John's Gospel, and uh, verse 13 through 15 of, of chapter 16 of John's Gospel. But to begin with, this is uh, verse 26 uh, from chapter 14 in John's Gospel. And Jesus says, But the paraclete, the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, 
He will teach you all things and bring all things to your mind whatsoever I shall have said to you. So he will teach you all things. Yes, he gave us scripture. He gave us the deposit of faith in the church. But how do we enact, how do we put it into action? What does it mean for our lives? And, you know, the, the scriptures is basically like the framework of the building. But our Lord, through the Holy Ghost and the teachings and writings of the saints and the teachings of the church, fills in all the walls and the beauty, the interior, the exterior, the roof, you see, so that we could live what is written in Scripture fully. So let's go to chapter 16 in John's Gospel, verse 6. But because I have spoken these things to you, sorrow hath filled your heart, but I tell you the truth. It is expedient to you that I go, for if I go not, the paraclete will not come. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he is come, he will convince the world of sin and of justice and of judgment, of sin because they believe not in me, and of justice because I go to the Father and you shall see me no longer, and of judgment because the prince of this world is already judged. I have yet many things to say to you but you cannot bear them now. So our Lord isn't finished his instruction. He's not finished yet. And he promises the paraclete, it's better that I go. So like he can send the spirit of truth, the spirit of his father. And in verse 14, but when he, when 13, but when he, the spirit of truth is come, he will teach you all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but what things soever he shall hear, he shall speak, and the things that are to come he shall show you. He shall glorify me, because he shall receive of mine, and show it to you. All things whatsoever the Father hath are mine. Therefore I said that he shall receive of mine, and show it to you. So our Lord is continually coming in the spirit of the Father, and he speaks very powerfully through the communion of the saints. And this is pretty much what we want to talk about tonight. So to begin with, to recap on what we talked about last week, we, we mentioned that Mary, um, why it's so important for us to look to Mary and to imitate her, because she's the greatest of saints. No other saint has loved God more than Mary. No other saint than all the angels and saints um, honors God more than Mary. Is, is purer than Mary. So we want to look to her example as to how she loves God so profoundly, how she worships God, how she adores God, how she honors God, how she prays to God, and how she imitates God, especially in his virtues, and especially the virtues of humility and purity. Humility and purity. This is what is so pleasing to our God because our Lord exalts us if we humble ourselves. And how highly exalted, how highly exalted daughter because of her profound humility. And we really want to look to Mary so that we can imitate her in that humility so that God can exalt us too with her and all the saints and angels. So, we know that Mary teaches us, guides us, she nurtures us, she protects us in every way so that we can, we can become perfect images through her intercession by the grace of God, pleasing to the Father. Now, we mentioned that last week. And I, I also mentioned that I, this was an inspiration that I, that I got before the Blessed Sacrament and adoration, and the Lord put it on my heart. This, to teach what we taught last week. And lo and behold, the following day, which was a Wednesday, happened to be the Feast of St. John Bosco. And the priest gave a beautiful homily, which he included a little bit on the life and, and the spirituality of John Bosco and, how, and our mission our Lord gave to him. And one of the things the priest directed our attention to is how our Lord Jesus appeared to St. John Bosco and he, he appeared with Blessed Mother to St. John Bosco. And our Lord points to Mary 
and he looks at St. John, and he says, John, here is your teacher and your guide. He's talking about our Blessed Mother. What a powerful statement. Here is your teacher and your guide. I can't get a better example of how our Lord so desires that we take Mary into our own home, with, and, but via consecration especially, which simply means is just let her mother you. Let her mother us to become that teacher and the guide. So what a beautiful confirmation. I just thought I would share that with you just to add a little more credibility, you know. And again, I want to mention that and that we don't, we're not trying to deify Mary. And our Lord wouldn't want that, and Mary wouldn't want that. But, but here's an endorsement by St. Maximilian Colby and St. Louis de Montfort on along the lines of what I just said. And this is what they endorse. The whole point of consecration to Mary is not to exalt Mary to the level of deity or to place her in competition with Christ. True consecration to Mary leads to greater love and service for Christ. That is the whole idea, and this is truly why Jesus so lovingly gave us his mother while he was hanging on the cross to become the beloved disciples who take her into her, their own home. So Mary certainly is one of the greatest treasures that we have in the, in the Catholic faith as part of the communion with saints. And, we, we, and I'm, I'm emphasizing the absolute benefits of taking advantage of this great grace and look to her and to, and to do everything in and through her. Because basically that's what Jesus did. That's what God did. He did everything in and through her. He came to humanity through her. He was born the Savior through her. You see? The church at Pentecost, she gave, God gave birth to the church through Mary. The Holy Spirit overshadowed her at Pentecost. And like a prism, the Holy Spirit went flowed through the heart of Mary and parted as tongues of fire on the twelve apostles. Absolutely incredible. So she truly is the spouse of the Holy Ghost, the spouse of the Spirit of Truth, the spouse of the Spirit of the Father, whom Jesus promised will, he will send to teach us all things, to teach us all truth. Okay. So let's begin our passion meditation. And these are revelations of the Sacred Heart concerning the events of the evening and night of Holy Thursday. And a few of the saints that is revealed our Lord speaks to. Um, one of them is Marie Catherine Pudding. Putigny, another is Camilla Baptista, and of course St. Margaret Mary, um, who is all about the Sacred Heart devotion. And uh, I think you're going to find these readings and these teachings by our Lord, as he so promised, I will teach you all things and uh, teach you all truth. And he's using the saints to put it together for us so that we could see with our eyes and here with our ears, an actual example of what it means to be transformed and converted according to the gospel and live a, live a holy life according to the gospel. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. So the first one is how fruitful is the meditation of the passion and agony of Gethsemane to the soul? And it says, once on a Good Friday, Marie Catherine Putigny, meditating on the agony of Jesus, heard our Lord addressing her in this way. Many there are who believe that it is enough for them to consider my infinite goodness and to shed some tears of compassion on my sufferings to please me. True love seeks to share in my sufferings. True love endures submissively sorrows, humiliations, 
ignominies in union with mine, and thus united offers them up to my eternal Father. Now remember in the Gospel, our Lord says, if you wish to be my disciple, you must deny yourself. Pick up your cross daily and follow me. He who does not want to pick up his cross daily, deny himself and follow me, is not worthy of me. So our Lord clearly is teaching through this saint not to just have mere tears, which we all should have anyways, but he wants us to pick up our cross and share in his passion. Actually take a share. Of course, he wants us to share everything about him, not only his joys, but also his sorrows and passion, so that we can rise with glory in him, as St. Paul teaches us. We undergo many, many trials and many dyings and risings, but the ultimate resurrection in Christ is when we die to self and share in the cross of Christ and share in his crucifixion so that when we die, we shall also rise in glory with him. And our Lord is very making it very clear um, how he desires that we share in his passion and share even in his sufferings. Now, this requires a lot of trust. And we need to trust our Lord that he's not going to give us and overwhelm us. He knows how much we can handle. But what I find is, as one of my meditations, one day I was in the church, and I was suffering what I would call like an oppressive feeling, a heaviness that was very irritating. And I went to the church, and I and I knelt before the tabernacle, next to one of the stations of the cross, and I believe it was the second station of the cross, where our Lord picked up his cross. But in this particular version of the, of the second station, our Lord was arms were outstretched with this incredibly loving, welcoming look to embrace his cross. He couldn't wait to embrace it. And that taught me that I need to do the same thing. And I realized that I knew, I knew that I must embrace this heaviness, this, this um, oppression, this, this irritability. So I simply said, Lord, I embrace it. I accept it as your will for me. And just like in the agony in the garden when our Lord said, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me, but nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. That's basically what I was saying. I want it to pass, but not my will. Your will be done. If this is your will for me, Lord, I accept it, and I embrace it, and I embrace my cross and this little pain that you sent to me so that I can imitate you, Jesus, in, in embracing your cross because you embraced your cross for love of me. I embrace this cross for love of you. And lo and behold, As soon as I said I accept it, I embrace it with love, our Lord lifted it. The oppression lifted. It was like a breath of fresh air. It became lighter. I accepted that cross at that moment, and our Lord took it, and I know he was pleased. But that, what a great lesson that was in sharing in his passion. It was nothing what Jesus suffered, but all of our little crosses and trials that we undergo, our little storms in our lives, or whatever they may be, we simply say, Jesus, it, let this cup pass from me. It's, it's painful, and you know it's painful, and you know I don't like it, Lord. But nevertheless, not my will, your will be done. I accept it. And you watch. The power of that, it'll go away. And what else happens is when we embrace our cross at that moment, the grace that God is offering through that, through that sharing in Christ's passion takes effect and takes root in our soul, and we become stronger. We are strengthened, and we grow. So our choices are to accept it or reject it. And if we reject the cross, we reject grace. We're rejecting Christ. So we need to say, I accept it, so that that grace that he is offering 
it, it, it takes root in our soul. And not only that, since we are embracing it and we're offering it through Jesus to the Father, our, the God the Father is bestowing mercy on sinners in the world. Because in effect, we're kind of like being a little Jesus, taking the effects of the sins of a certain person or sins of the world upon ourselves. And when we do that, God lifts the weight of their sins off of the, the sinners. And then he bestows his mercy and grace so he can reach them. Otherwise, without God's mercy, no one would stand a chance. So in a sense, it's an extremely charitable thing, uniting our sufferings to the cross of Christ so that God could bestow his mercy and grace on the rest of the world. We're imitating Christ. And this is another reason why we need the mother of Jesus who will strengthen us like she strengthened John, the only disciple that was at the foot of the cross. Where were the other apostles? They were in hiding. But John had the guts to be there. Why? Because of Mary. Because of Mary. It's unbelievable. So we ask for your intercession, dear mother, for this grace so that we can embrace all of our crosses and sufferings, no matter how hard they may be, and unite them to the cross of Christ through your immaculate heart so that God can bestow his great mercy upon the rest of humanity. And, and, and so that you could obtain the grace of conversion for them so they can enjoy the wonderful life of God in us, in our souls, and in the world. So again, one Holy Thursday evening, says a holy nun, and I don't know who this nun is, but nevertheless, a holy nun's great devotee to the Sacred Heart, she knelt down to pray but could not pray at all. The memory of Jesus' passion filled her mind. She said, I felt myself irresistibly attracted to follow and suffer with Jesus in his sacred passion. I saw him alone, separated from his disciples, prostrate on the ground. And I heard him say, My God, let this chalice pass from me, yet thy will be done, not mine. So here, here's Jesus expressing what we just talked about. I then went to his side to wipe away the copious sweat of his sacred face. And Jesus said, You come to assist me, my daughter, when everyone else has abandoned me? I thank you. I thank you. So our Lord is pleased because when we share in his passion and suffering, we are actually consoling Jesus during his passion and suffering. Then I said, Lord, how great is your sorrow? And he said, my daughter, you cannot fathom it, even if you try. At my agony, the pains and sufferings of my passion came all at once to flood my soul. And the pious souls that remember the sufferings honor and comfort me by what they call the memory of the agony in the garden. And here's another testimony by uh, apparition of the Sacred Heart of Jesus to St. Margaret Mary. And this date of the apparition uh, was beginning of June 1674, the Friday within the octave of Corpus Christi. And it says, on one occasion, she says, in other words, uh, St. Margaret, Whilst the, the bread sac blessed sacrament was expo exposed, Jesus Christ, my sweet master, presented himself to me all resplendent with glory, his five wounds shining like five suns. From his sacred body it issued flames on all sides, but especially from his adorable breast, which resembled a furnace. And he then showed his sacred heart, the living source of these flames. Then he revealed to me the excess of his love towards men. He complained of their ingratitude and said that he felt this more keenly than any other pains during his passion. Wow, so the ingratitude of men, what's he talking about? Men who couldn't care less what Jesus suffered and died so he could open the gates of heaven 
set them free of their sins, indifference. People who don't even give thought to what our Lord did to them. This is the most painful thing for our Lord. And, and I can't even imagine how unconsolable it must be for our Lord, for those souls whom he suffered, and he probably saw in his agony in the garden, those souls who, who totally rejected this great grace and wound up ending up in hell where our Lord suffered in vain for that. I can't even imagine. So please, um, we need to um, pray for souls, pray for the conversion of sinners, like Our Lady prescribed at Fatima. Pray for souls, especially those in most need of God's mercy, so that she could save her other children. If they made me return, he said, I'm sorry, if they made me a return, meaning for love, he said, all that I have done for them would appear but little to my love, but they show only coldness in their love towards me, and the only return they make to my advances is to reject me. Do you at least give me the consolation of supplying for their ingratitude as far as you are able? So here we are seeing our Lord is constantly making advances at souls to invite them to his merciful love, and it continually is being rejected. The door is being shut in his face through indifference, through materialism, through atheism, through uh, secular everything, through um, moral relativism, through egoism, pride. The world, the flesh, and the devil, the three areas of concupiscence. God is being rejected, and most of humanity is seduced by the evil one through these worldly things. And their attention is directed towards earthly things and not the things of heaven, as St. Paul teaches us to do. On my representing to him my inability, Jesus said, this will strengthen you in your weakness. And at the same time, his heart opened, and there issued from it so burning a flame that I thought I would have been consumed by it. I could not bear it. And I asked him to have pity on my weakness. I will be your strength, Jesus said. Fear nothing. But be attentive to what I tell you and the following requests I make to you in order to dispose you for the accomplishment of my designs. You shall receive in the first place holy communion as often as holy obedience shall permit you. Whatever mortifications or humiliations it may cause you, for they are pledges of my love. You shall also communicate on the first Friday of each month Every night between Thursday and Friday, I will make you share in that mortal sadness suffered in the Garden of Olives. And this participation in my sadness will be to you an agony harder than death. You shall bear me company in the humble prayer I offered at that time to my Father in my anguish. For this purpose, you shall rise between 11 o'clock and midnight and remain prostrate with me for an hour to appease the divine anger by imploring mercy for poor sinners and also to sweeten in some way the bitterness I felt at that time in being abandoned by my apostles, which obliged me to reproach them for not having been able to watch with me for one hour. You shall do during this hour what I shall tell you. And this is what he told her. Raise your heart and hands towards heaven with prayers and holy deeds, offering me always to my eternal Father as a victim of love, immolated and offered for the sins of the world. Put me as a fortress, as a citadel between his divine justice and sinners to obtain mercy for them. Wow. So how do we get the strength to share in this kind of passion? Well, the Holy Eucharist, the bread of life, the bread of angels, the bread which come down from heaven. I am the bread which came down from heaven. 
he who eats of my flesh and drinks my blood, I abide in him, and he, he in me. He who does not eat of my flesh and drink my blood does not have life in them. So it is the bread of angels that sustains us and gives us the strength to endure such things. Not that all of us are called to this kind of passion and victimship as St. Mary, Margaret Mary, but if we are, we certainly need the Eucharist, and we absolutely need the Mother of God to assist us. And even St. John Paul II says that consecration to the Immaculate Heart of Mary is indispensable, especially in this day and age. We need her strength at the, foot of our, at the foot of the cross with Jesus, suffering along with him. Because he says, you must pick up your cross daily and follow me. Follow me. Imitate me. Follow me. Walk in my footsteps. So, St. Margaret Mary says where Christ suffered most, she says, meditating on the Savior the Garden of Olives plunged in an agony of grie grievous sorrow. I felt myself pressed to share in his sorrowing agony. Then he said to me, Here it was I suffered most interiorly, more than in all the rest of my passion, seeing myself abandoned by heaven and earth, laden with all the sins of mankind. In the presence of God's dread sanctity, I lay overwhelmed in his wrath, drinking to the dregs the bitter chalice of his indignation. Now that's St. Margaret talking. It was as if the father had forgotten his name or of the father in order to immolate me to his just and divine anger. No creature can understand the immensity of my torments. It is the same kind of agony a criminal soul experiences when appearing before his divine judge. God's holiness oppresses and crushes her with his right rigorous justice. If there were a new gospel to be written, said our Lord, one day to St. Margaret of Cortona, men could never understand the heart-rending grief of my soul in the Garden of Olives. I can imagine because scripture tells us that he sweated drops of blood. And according to psychiatrists or doctors, anybody who goes through that kind of trauma is suffering interior trauma, emotional, spiritual. I mean, we have no idea what our Lord suffered. But one of my meditations is he saw all the sins of all of mankind. He took them onto himself because Scripture tells us he became sin one who would not be recognized, whom, whom men would reject. You, you know, he became sin so that we can be set free of our sins. And he probably saw the souls who would reject this great grace and for all eternity be lost by their own volition. And I can't even imagine what he was tormented at that point. One day after communion, our Lord showed Sister Francis of the Mother of God the enormous weight that oppressed his heart in the garden and during the whole of his passion. The load of divine justice crushed me the more because my own opposition to sin made the weight of his indignation heavier upon me. We must pray as Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. Preparing the soul of Blessed Baptista Varani for the trial she had to undergo, the Divine Master taught her how to pray in order to endure them with patience. This is what he told her. When I prayed in the Garden of Olives, my Heavenly Father was pleased to manifest to me all the torments and sorrows of my passion. Renouncing then my self-will, I answered him, Fiat voluntas tua. Thy will be done. From this burning meditation I went forth, so inflamed with his love, that willingly I chose to die amidst the most cruel tortures in my honor of my father, in honor of my father and for the salvation of souls. Remember earlier we had talked about how it's so important 
to embrace our own crosses and trials, accept them, and not to reject them. Because when we accept them, just like the Father strengthened Jesus in his agony by saying, Father, not my will, but your will be done, Jesus accepted everything from his Father in his honor. And and God the Father strengthened him. And the same thing for us. God the Father will strengthen us so we can bear our crosses with Jesus and follow in his footsteps. And our Lord tells us, he says, those that resemble me most in my pain and contempt will resemble me most in glory. Those who resemble me less in pain and contempt will therefore resemble me less in in glory. And he told that to St. Faustina. Three times I went back to my prayer wishing to show to all that a short prayer is not enough. So see that? Our Lord, he went back three times and he went and says, uh, he went to his apostles. Could you not wait one hour with me? But three times he went back in prayer. So he's telling us we need to persevere in prayer. Remember, he continued, I was God, that I came from heaven in order to suffer. Yet when the hour of my passion was approaching, my human nature wrung from me the piteous, the, the piteous cry, my father, if it be possible, let this chalice pass from me. I address the same words to you, my daughter. Though at different time you, a- you have asked me to let you suffer for me, when suffering draws near, you also shall send forth the cry of sorrow. Transient si possibile est. Let it pass if it is possible, provided you add fiat voluntas tua. None of your words shall cause me displeasure. So what he is saying is he knows your human nature is going to rebel against suffering. He knows our human nature is going to, it's going to not want it. Uh, it's totally against our nature. None of us like suffering. I don't, I don't like suffering. But nevertheless, when we share, when we imitate Christ, especially in his passion, especially those words, Father, not my will, but your will be done, that's when our Lord lifts it. Most of the time, he'll lift it and sweeten our pain. In fact, he might even totally remove it. But I can guarantee you this, he will strengthen us so that we can carry on with him, just as the God the Father strengthened our Lord to go on. He says, I have given you an example. I have even spoken thus that it may be a comfort and relief to you and to all those whom suffering may frighten. If in spite of this fear you persevere in your prayer, and if as a reward for that constant constancy, divine mercy reveals to you all the sorrows that will afflict your soul and at the same time inspires it with a longing to submit to them, then there will be such a perfect likeness between mine and your agony that my Father shall feel constrained to love you as he loves me. Wow! This is truly what pleases the Father. When we imitate Jesus in every way, in his virtues, and especially in his passion, who Jesus promises to strengthen us through the sacraments, and he gives us the communion with the saints, and he gives us his mother. So moving on, Revelations of the Sacred Heart to Blessed Camilla Baptista Verani. And she was a poor Clare nun back in 1458, and and she lived till 1527. Concerning his sorrow on the eve of his death. In the vision of the conduct and trials of his apostles, another heart-rending grief our Lord says, was my constant anxiety from my apostles. I saw them vacillating. I saw them falling. They who were to be the pillars of heaven 
and the foundations of my church on this earth. Know then, my daughter, no father ever had for his children, no brother for his brothers, no master for his pupils, such a tender and affectionate feeling than the one burning in my heart for my disciples, my brethren, my beloved sons. We all want to become like John, the beloved disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. And Scripture tells us, at the foot of the cross, he took Mary into his own home. Therefore, it was more for the thought of my apostles than for my own sufferings that I exclaimed, my soul is saddened even unto death. And then another pang, he says, pierced my heart like a sharp and poisonous dagger, namely, the malice and ingratitude of Judas, the treacherous apostle. This hardening of heart, this wickedness, the ingratitude of my chosen people, the blindness, the impiety, the ingratitude of all creatures. How great was the ingratitude of Judas. I had forgiven him all his sins. I had chosen him for one of my apostles. I had endowed him with the gift of miracles and the dispensation of all my treasures. When I saw him conceiving in his heart the design of betraying me, my love and tenderness increased. This is what Jesus does for all of us. When he sees our hearts hardening at his every advance, he increases his love, hoping, hoping to win our hearts over to him. He's pleading with us. Our God, the creator of heaven and earth, is literally begging us to turn to him and receive his mercy so that we will not we could we could be saved from our sins and our wretchedness so that we can enjoy being united with him in eternity for all forever in eternal bliss i long that he should abandon his wicked design but without avail i'm sure he saw this this is prior to his agony in the garden the more kindness I showed him, the more obstinate he became in his malice. Wow, how do we all identify with Jesus? Do we run away when, we, um, when God is calling us to some trial or suffering? Do we get angry? Do we reject that grace? Do we get mad at God? I mean, I'm guilty of that. And I had to learn that I need to embrace it and know that God is, is offering me some tremendous graces through the cross. Through the cross. And God does not intend bad things to happen to me as though he was a tyrant. No, God always has our best interest at heart, even when he sends us trials and tribulations, so that we can grow out of our wretchedness and grow in holiness and virtue so that we can most, more imitate Christ, his beloved son. And it is only through the purification of the trials, the tribulations, and the cross that we're purified. He knows it's not easy. He knows it's painful. But when we embrace it, it's almost as if the joy that comes acts, out, acts like Novocaine to numb the pain. It's amazing. And then we literally grow in leaps and bounds when we accept the cross. At the Last Supper, by the act of humility and affection in washing his feet, I tried again to change his heart. I humbled myself before him as before the others. Can you imagine that? God had to humble himself before Judas. What a God we have. Our Lord, our God, our creator. We are nothing to him, uh, compared to him. He is everything. We are nothing. Yet he loves us so much that he is willing to, to get on his knees before us and beg us to turn to him. When will we turn to him? When will we start listening to our Lord and start following him? so we can ease the pain of his broken heart, 
so that we can wipe away his tears and give him tears of joy because we let him embrace us and we embrace him and tell him we love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. Thank you for being my Savior. I am sorry for rejecting you all of these years. I am sorry for rejecting your every attempt and your every um, advance to show me your mercy and how much you love me. I embrace you now, Lord, and, I, and thy will be done, not mine. I make a resolve to do your will, to renounce sin, the world, the flesh, and the devil, and become a follower of you. And I wish to consecrate myself to the Immaculate Heart of Mary because I know she will help me and strengthen me in the way, in your way, Jesus. You said you are the truth, the life, and the way. And I want to follow you. I no longer want to be of the world, the flesh, and the devil. I no longer want to seek things apart from you. I want to seek you, Jesus. I want to love you with my whole heart, mind, soul, and strength. I humbled myself before him as before the others, but then my heart gave way and I burst into tears. The while I spoke to his heart thus, O Judas, what have I done to thee that thou shouldest so heartlessly betray me? O evil-minded disciple, shall this be the last of my graces to thee? O man of perdition, why would you abandon your master and savior? Judas, if you needed 30 pieces of silver, why? Go, go and ask them from my mother and from thine, from your mother and my mother, Jesus is saying. Go get the silver pieces that my mother is offering you, not the world, the flesh, and the devil. This is what he's saying. She would rather become a slave, if so. She could prevent thy crime and save my life. O oh, Judas, insensible and ungrateful follower, I am going to wash and kiss thy feet, and in a few hours thou shalt have given me a treacherous kiss. O oh, my beloved disciple, what a sorrow. Return for all my love and tenderness. What a sorrowful return for all my love and tenderness. Yes, I weep over thy loss more than over my sufferings because I came to redeem and save the world. While my heart thus spoke to him, my tears poured over his feet, but he did not even notice it. My goodness, how hardened are we to the love of God? Do we not see Jesus' tears weeping over our feet? how we need to take pity on our Savior and turn to him with all our hearts and console our Lord who is so, he's trying so hard to save our souls. But John, the beloved disciple to whom I had revealed the secrets of my passion during the Last Supper, saw my anguish and grief, and I knew all my love and sorrow. When a loving father assists a dying son, he is eager to supply every need and to give him all possible relief. And when he dies, does he not say, Farewell, beloved one? This is my last help I can give thee. Thus did I deal with this unfortunate traitor. John, who saw all this, was dismayed with grief. As I came before him the last, he in his humility had chosen the last place. He fell on my shoulder and embraced me, saying, O oh, my dear Master and Savior, how could you touch with your divine hands and kiss with your sacred lips the feet of that infamous one? We should all become like John the Beloved and love our awesome Savior, our loving, tender, loving God, Jesus, the way John the Beloved does. Do not lower yourself to wash away the dust of my feet and seal your love with your sacred lips. Every new token of your infinite love increases the sorrow of my heart at this sad hour. 
Obedience, however, made him submit to the Savior's command, and Jesus washed his feet as he had done for all of them. This I have told thee, concluding our Lord to the blessed Camilla Baptista, to show how deep and bitter my sorrow was for the wickedness and ingratitude of my disciple. Meaning Judas. And he speaks about his own people, the Jewish nation. He says, the obstinate hatred of the Jews was a great sorrow to me. Whenever I thought of the love I had shown to my people, this sorrow seemed the greater. Only my bitter experience can one understand the intensity of the anguish of heart when, it, when insulted and hated by those who have been most favored. No words can adequately describe it. And how Jesus suffered from the obstinacy of sinners. In meditating one night, says St. Veronica Juliana, I saw a vision. The Savior covered with the sweat of blood of his agony. Our Lord manifested to me how the perfidy and obstinacy of hardened sinners and the little effect obtained by the shedding of his precious blood caused him pain. And Jesus said to me, Whoever shares with me in this intimate agony of my heart shall have all his prayers for grace answered by me. He then said to me, My beloved, I suffered much indeed when carrying my cross to Mount Calvary. Overwhelming was my grief when I met my dearest mother, Yet deeper still was my wretchedness and sorrow to see so many souls unwilling to avail themselves of such bitter torments. The life of Venerable Agatha the Cross was one of exterior and interior pain and anguish. One day, appearing to her... Our Lord, showing his sacred heart as it was in the Garden of Olives, said to her, See, daughter, those waves of bitterness and sorrow that broke in upon me from all parts, I wish them to enter thy heart also. From that moment, a veritable torture crucified her souls. So how do we endure? I mean, again, if God is calling us, then we must, no matter what he's calling us to, we need to say, not my will, but thy will be done, and accept whatever comes. Most of us are not called to this kind of victimship, although there are many called to that kind of victimship, and our Lord provides the grace. He told St. Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. And he's telling all these souls that he's choosing as to be their victim to share in his passion in the deepest way, he is telling them, my grace is sufficient for you, and we need to trust that. We need to believe that and have faith in God and know that he will strengthen us during these incredible trials that he's calling us to. On Good Friday, 1637, Joan de Chantel begged most insistently, if it were not against the will of God to be relieved from her interior anguish and sorrow, in answer came a voice firm and definite, Lo, the man of sorrows was not spared. And do you think to be better treated? My goodness. My daughter said to our Lord, to blessed Gemma Galgani, he said, I want souls to make themselves victims for me to appease the just wrath of God. Those victims by their sufferings and torments and privations should make reparation for ungrateful sinners. And finally, one Friday within an octave of Corpus Christi, 1896, Sister Mary of the Divine Heart asked our Lord, Why this prolongation of my illness and my sufferings? Jesus answered, I have redeemed mankind by the cross. By the cross also do I sanctify my elect. The more firmly I fasten a soul to the cross, the more her sufferings make her like to me. And the closer her union becomes with me, the sufferings of my elect can be described as a continuation of the work of my redemption. Each time a spouse of mine unites herself to me by suffering, 
Each time my redemption is enriched with a fresh jewel. And that reminds me of St. Paul to the Colossians verse one, uh, chapter 124. I make up for what is lacking in the sufferings of Christ. I take it in my own flesh. This is what he's talking about. And I wish I had more time to read that particular gospel, uh, scripture text. But until next time, well, let's see here. Colossians. He says, Wherefore I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God which is given me towards you, that I may fulfill the word of God, the mystery which had been hidden from ages and generations, but now is manifested to the saints, who I now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up those things that are wanting of the sufferings of Christ in my flesh for his body, which is the church. So there you have it. This is basically what these saints and what our Lord is calling these saints to victimship, St. Paul is talking about in the Colossians, and that's all the time we have for folks. And I thank you for listening. And we, and we thank God our Father with all the love in our hearts shown us tonight and taught us through the heart of Jesus, through the heart of Mary. Amen. And God bless all of you. Until next time, have a great week. God bless. We hope you enjoyed the program and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.